All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about MD. So I loaded two papers on, on the Slack lecture materials. And um, so you can go there under the lecture materials um, channel and see the papers. So if you are doing, if you, if you want to do MD, I, one thing that I want to emphasize, and this is emphasized in, in this review that's basically named, you know, um, MD best practices is um, MD can be, can take a lot of time to do right. Both in terms of you learning how to do it and also in terms of uh, cost of computational resources. So it isn't just, well, I don't know what to do. I'll just do MD. You really need to have a reason for doing MD and don't expect it to go quickly. Okay. And, um, you know, ideally you should have a hypothesis, right? That you're trying to test and a hypothesis that you think it's likely the MD could tell you something useful or test that hypothesis, right? Uh, you know, there's, I guess there, you know, in our lab, we, we do try to use the, the simulations sometimes to develop hypotheses that we didn't test experimentally. And we also use the experiments to develop hypotheses that we test using simulations. So it kind of works both ways, but so there is a bit sometimes of just seeing, um, you know, if there's something interesting in the simulations, but really at the base of it, of all the things, the simulations that we do really are, are is experimental work. And we have to have, you know, see a difference in experiment and just go, okay, well, how, how's, why is that happening? How is that working? And if it seems likely that uh, we can access the time scales necessary using MD to test and to figure out what what is going on, then we'll do MD, um, and and that's something that um, it's also good to keep in mind is that you know I, you've probably seen versions of this slide multiple times during this conference, but if you have a bunch of atoms, like most of the atoms in the protein moving together, that's not going to happen very often. It's going to happen, um, you know, there, of course, there's correlations in between the atoms, but by and large, if you're going to have a bunch of atoms moving together, it's going to take a long time for, for that to happen, okay? So you get slow movements that span the entire protein, okay? And usually, those are the movements that, well, not all the time, but a lot of times, those are the movements you're actually interested in. They're the ones that are affecting function of the receptor or the protein, okay? And I just want to point out that if you're trying to access movements in the millisecond to second time scale, number one, that's not going to happen using conventional MD, okay? You're not even going to get, to get close. So it's, it's good to understand the um, like what you're, what you're trying to see in your particular system. And if that it, it involves uh, sampling confirmations that you think would only happen, say you, you have some NMR data and you see transitions between two confirmations on the, you know, two or three second time scale, then, or on the seconds time scale, that's going to be very difficult to sample. You, you could try using some accelerated or enhanced sampling methods, but even then it's still going to be really difficult. And you're going to have to invest a lot of um, computational resources in there and it may never work out, okay? Because some of, the, some of these slow movements could be orders of magnitude beyond what you can sample. And so waiting, you know, just running for another, you know, 
two months or something, if you have a dedicated computer that you can use is not gonna do it. You would have to run for another two decades or something, right? And that's not going to happen. So that's the first thing is really, and I've, I've seen this in, in some people that have just start, you know, want to learn MD, they don't have a good feel for what's possible, right? And I'm just saying there are definite limits to what's possible with MD. And you need to look, think carefully about what you're trying to do and whether or not it's possible. And you know, and ask people what they think. This is, this is what I'm interested in seeing. Do you think it's possible to access this with MD? And if so, what type of MD should I use? Okay. Um, and that was one big point in this best practices. The other, another big point is, of course, the, the, the things, the, the, the structures that you see in, um, in the PDB data bank, except for, well, AlphaFold, which is in Unipro, you can click on it and get an AlphaFold structure. AlphaFold generally is gonna contain all the residues won't contain any ligands or anything else, but um, it'll contain all the residues. But the actual crystal structures, they're almost always gonna be missing pieces, right? And you need to be really careful about how you put those pieces back. And one of the, one of the biggest things that I think people don't think about so much is, you know, especially if, you know, all the titratable groups, say histidines, they can be, there can be different protonation states for histidines, for example, right? You can have an, a proton or a hydrogen on the epsilon nitrogen, on the delta nitrogen, or on both of those nitrogens. And all of those are physically possible at physiologic pH. And you have to pick one, right? For all of the histidines in your, in your protein. And there's various ways to, there's various programs out there that will help you pick a, re, may, help you guesstimate what, what the protonation state should be for those histidines. The crystal structure isn't gonna contain that information, okay? You have to use, I think I put up here something like H++, maybe, yeah. There's other programs, there's a free version of the, a program called Flare that, that can be used to, to figure out the protonation states. There's a lot of different programs that can be used. Um, but uh, especially when you're dealing with a ligand, like a small molecule, a drug, right? That, those can be especially difficult to figure out uh, or especially important to figure out what the real protonation state is. So. There's some resources that you can look at. PubChem sometimes will tell you what the um, uh, formal charge is of the entire molecule, I, I believe. But it, it, I've seen PKAs in PubChem usually. And a lot, oftentimes, I mean, there are, there are paid programs that you can use to figure out the, the PKAs and what the protonation state should be. Um, Flare, again, can, um, there's free version of Flare that will, you can put your ligand in there and you can say edit ligand and then, um, I mean, I can just show it real quickly. Uh, this, is, this is free for download for anyone. And this could be a resource that you could use. Um, so, let's see, I, I, I thought I had it pulled up, but oh, maybe I don't. Hold on one sec. I'll just pull it up just so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, this isn't this isn't the best. Actually, the, some of the best that I've used are, are, are the Schrodinger is from the Schrodinger software, but that costs a lot of money, and you know sometimes you don't. Uh, you, you don't have access to that. So um, let me see if I can open a, open a ligand. Oh, there's already some loaded in here. I can use some of those. I'll just do that. File. And we'll just pick this, see what happens. 
Okay, so here's the ligand and we can go, uh, I haven't used this that, that much. We've just started using this in our lab. Uh, it's not gonna let me, anyways, you would push, I don't know why it's not letting me edit this. I think it's because it's, I haven't separated it out yet. I'm not gonna take the time to do that. But basically you would put, open up your ligand in here that you get from say PubChem and then you would just hit edit and then it would allow you to, um, uh, uh, let's see, maybe if I copy and paste it or something. I, anyways, I don't, yeah. Um, it, it, then it allows you to uh, protonate the ligand based on a pH of seven. So that's one way you can go about this is use this program flare, okay? Um, that's that's one example. So that's just something to keep in mind. You really need to pay attention to what the protonation states because those are important, okay? Let's see. The other thing is, is that, well, except for some very specific force fields, for example, in amber, where um, the protonation state can change during the simulation, in general, it's not going to, it's not going to change. And so you're stuck with the protonation state that you start with. And of course, in reality, probably the protonation state is going to change throughout, would change throughout the simulation. Um, but you, you need to pick something and you, sometimes what, what we've done is do simulations in two different protonation states and compare them. If you're really not, sh if you think that both protonation states would contribute to some kind of biological outcome, then you could do two, two separate simulations at two different protonation states. Say for a ligand, the, say the PKA of a titratable group on the ligand is 7.4 and you're running your simulations at 7.4. So then it would make sense to do two different simulations, one with it protonated, one where the hydrogen isn't attached. That's one possibility. Um, this is the other thing. When you're running, when you're doing your build of your system, you really need to carefully check your system. Okay, we have in our lab run um, simulations for hundreds of microseconds that were not the simulations we were intending to run. And that's a lot of cost, right? So, and you know, just because the simulation is running doesn't mean that it's correct. You need to go back and, and create a PDB from the simulation trajectory, look at it, right? Make sure at least for the ligand that all it looks like the the right number of bonds are there for the ligand. Um, you know, that's hard to do for the entire protein, but um, just in general, look at it and see if you can see anything that looks obviously wrong. Uh, the other thing is there are, there are many ligands in the PDB data bank that have the wrong chirality. So that can trip you up. So, there's mistakes in the PDB, in the crystal structures, okay? So you really need to compare, you know, um, uh, the published structures of the ligands with what's in the PDB, if that's where you're getting your ligand from. And these, you know, sm seemingly small changes, such as this, um, the chirality at this chiral center, uh, for these two, um, uh, uh, these two ligands can totally change the behavior of the ligand. One's an antagonist in this protein that we study and the other is an agonist. And um, it can be difficult sometimes to distinguish the two in a crystal structure. So if you, you know, um, however you need to do it, make sure that the crystal structure is correct. The other thing is, I remember when I, I did, I started doing MD simulations when I did a postdoc in, in Tom Cheatham's lab, who's at the University of Utah, and he's one of the developers of AMBER. And he said, you know, really the problem isn't 
um, running the simulations or running the simulations fast enough, you'll find as you run more simulations that the real problem is, is storing the data. And we have found that in our lab. We are out of storage and you just can't keep hacking on terabytes of storage. It's too expensive. So one thing, you know, when I remember when I, this was in, you know, like uh, 2014, they, they were saving their simulations every, I think it was every 10 picoseconds. You know, now we're saving our simulations every nanosecond or every 10 nanoseconds. We're saving a trajectory. So that's one thing you can do. Just because someone else saves every 10 picoseconds doesn't mean you have to. And it really gets down to how long do you think you're going to run it for and what kind of um, dynamics are you interested in? If you don't care about the past dynamics or you're running it for a very long time, um, you can... Um, you don't have to you don't have to save so often sorry i'm my son's home without parents so i'm going to answer this call right now to make sure he's okay Sorry about that, but um, he's a little bit, uh, his, his mom just left on an airplane today and his dad's been in Thailand for two weeks. So <laughs> he's a little bit, this is the first time he's been away from his parents for a long time. So um, yeah, if the other thing is, is that uh, when you're using um, computer clusters or computers that other people are using, and just for ease of, analysis, oftentimes it makes sense to, to break your simulations or break your runs, your production runs up into little chunks, right? Don't run, if you're planning on running for 10 microseconds, don't just do one run for 10 microseconds. No, break it up into a half a microsecond or a microsecond at a time. And that way you will not, uh, may not make all the other users want to kill you um, by just you know, using the resources of the computer uh, forever for months on end. Okay. Um, so now on to convergence. And maybe before we get here, do you guys, I just want to ask any questions or anything you want to say about this, this first part before we start talking about convergence? Just general what to do for simulations, what to watch out for. Okay, so some of you have asked what convergence is. Um, really, if you read the paper that I attached to uh, Slack, um, you you could there's there's measures to see if you if it's likely that you're nearing convergence, but you can never really be sure that you have reached convergence for a simulation, and by Convergence, what I mean is that you've sampled enough in, uh, of the day in the life of a, of a molecule that you can tell somebody everything that they would ever want to know about that molecule, okay? And then it gives you an accurate idea about that entire molecule's life, okay? So if you, if you compare this to a person, um, I could give you an example of what lack of convergence looks like. So if I was, um, say my simulation involves two people. The people are the simulation, okay? And so in this experiment, I'm going to dress one person in, in blue clothes and the other person in white clothes. And I'm going to say go and I'm going to observe them and 
determine what the color of clothes, what impact that has on the person's life and in their behavior. So I say go and one person is, um, you know, soon after I say, you know, start the experiment, the person lays down and goes to sleep while the other person is, is um, uh, you know, up watching TV or, or on their phone, okay? And I run my experiment for an hour. I could conclude then that the, the, the blue clothes um, make people sleep and the white clothes make people use telephones because I've looked at them for an hour. But if I looked at their lives for over the next year, I could probably tell you, you know, obviously that isn't true. Blue clothes, you know, make people sleep. That's total BS, right? But what if I looked for a a much longer time, I could get a much better idea and I'd probably find out that, um, you know, this isn't a perfect analogy, but that these people are pretty similar, that they do about the same things and the clothes, color of their clothes really doesn't make any difference, okay? It's just, if you're looking at a protein system for a short amount of time, whatever differences you, you think you see in between that and, and something else may not be representative of the whole life of the protein, okay? And um, at the end of the day, one of the best ways to assure yourself that you are, you're seeing a good representation of what this molecule does, what this biomolecule does, is to do replicates, just like any other experiment, okay? Treat it as an experiment. This is something that Charlie pointed out, like, um, when he gave his talk, is these are experiments, Okay? You need to do replicates. And what the replicates allow you to do is to see, say I have my control replicates and I have my test replicates. And there's, I'm, I'm seeing the effect that ligand binding has on this protein. Well, if I do, you know, 10 replicates or six replicates for the control and six replicates for the test, and I see in all those six replicates, something happening that isn't happening in the other six replicates, I can have some, and they started from either the same or similar um, uh, structures, very similar structures, I can have some, it gives you some degree of confidence that what you're seeing has to do with the ligand and not some random stochastic process, okay? So uh, just like any other experiment, you need controls, you need the test, and you need to do replicates. Okay, in order to really tell if, if something is having an effect. What it also allows you to do is you can compare individual replicates to each other and to see, um, this will give you an idea of whether or not the proteins are sampling the same, uh, overall the same energy landscape or the same, uh, you know, confirmations. If, the, if you were getting complete sampling, which you would, which you could say is you're approaching convergence, then um, you would expect to see similar behavior in all of your replicates. If you're not, the replicates are gonna look very different, okay? And one of the easiest ways, there's a number of different ways of, of doing replicates and setting up replicates. You could start from different structures, although you know there's pluses and minuses to that, but uh, one of the most common things to do is you just randomize the atomic velocities at the beginning of the of the simulation and that allows you to do and with time the simulations will diverge because of those randomized atomic velocities and you will get independent replicates um, forming and if you're in, more interested in this just read the paper it goes into a lot of depth about how to test the level of convergence that you have and um, and how to, uh, yeah, basically how to tell if you have sampled enough. So that's, that's all I have right now. Does anybody have any questions on sampling, basically? All right. Yeah.
Uh, you say that your protocol is to run six replicates. So if I'm just wondering if like, like let's say out of the six, like five shows like a similar trend, but only one is like various uh, a lot. Do you like run another one or do you use the, include that as your result? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we, we've, you, um, it, basically what it tells you is that you're, you're not converged and to take whatever meaning you're getting out of those simulations with a grain of salt, right? That, you know, the, and yeah, I would just report it. I wouldn't get rid of that unless there's good reason to, right? Um, I, I can think of at least one instance where we actually found a good reason to throw away one because it was acting differently. And so there, it can happen, but in general, you wouldn't just throw away the, I mean, it's kind of like excluding outliers in experimental data, right? You have to have really good justification for that. And I would say you should, you know, definitely mention that and why you threw it away in, in, in the paper, if it's going to be in a paper. So. All right, and I would just, oh, Jeremiah. So uh, I guess my question's more on the previous topic about the, what kind of issues you run into. So do you have, what kind of, what are some common pitfalls? Like you check your simulation and you realize it's going poorly or it's going wrong and you need to fix it. What are some common pitfalls and how do you solve them? If there's anything that comes to mind immediately. Yeah, one of the most common things I've seen is that the, when you're doing the build, uh, sometimes the, the atom names are not exactly what the program is expecting. And sometimes it'll just replace those without really screaming at you. And um, then you end up with the wrong molecule. <laughs> so, uh, especially for ligands, that's a problem. And so if you're simulating with ligands, really check your ligand carefully after you're totally done with your build and you're ready to do your production run. Look at it. Does it have, you know, the right number of bonds at each atom? Does, are all the atoms right? Just, you need to look at it. Well, I mean, for us, we're not doing, you know, a thousand simulations at once. So we, uh, you know, just visually look at it in say like Chimera or something and compare it to, you know, the known uh, structure of the ligand and is it, you know, is it correct? Yeah. Yeah. When I run MD simulations, I uh, am a little bit worried that I'm not using the right number of ions, like sodium and chloride ions, in my simulations. One, uh, how detrimental is that if you don't get the right ion levels? And two, how do you actually make sure, because I know you use a script, but I don't know exactly what that does. So yeah, the um, as far as how detrimental, I mean, I think it depends on your system, but in general, I would think having, you know, the opinion of of some people that I've talked to that have done, you know, that's, that have worked on force field development things, they were not overly concerned that if you had, say, double the amount of ions, that it was really going to have a huge effect. Um, how you, you know, uh, how we do it, we use this script, I don't know if, but it just basically, you measure the volume of your periodic box, and then you figure out, well, if I want 50 millimolar sodium chloride in there, how many atoms of sodium chloride do I need to put in that box? And we have a little script that calculates, you know, the, um, it gives you a number for the, the number of atoms you should, or a number of ions you should add. And then we just add that number, those number of ions. Um, in protein, different ligand. Uh, how would that 
this is such a specific question, sorry, but like if I have a different ligand, but the same protein, like if I change something or I add a mutation to the protein, do I have to change the number of ions or does it just depend on the number of waters I have in my system? Yeah, I'd say you wouldn't have to change it. I mean, the there's two parts to what we do. We neutralize, because your, your protein is going to be usually, if you're working with the protein or RNA, it's going to be charged. So you should really neutralize the whole system first. And there's, you know, different software out there that, like, I know how it works in Amber. I'm sure Gromax and MD, whatever, they do similar things. You can just do the build to where you neutralize everything. So we neutralize everything with, with to where you have a total charge of zero in your system. And then we add, you know, 50 millimolar salt of some kind or whatever it happens to be. Um, and so in that case where you're just changing the ligand, I don't think, um, well, I guess if the, if the ligand, if the formal charge on the ligand changed, that would probably be a problem because you don't want to have uh, a charged over a net charge for your entire system. So it might be a problem. Yeah. Michelle. Hi, Travis. I, um, uh, Dr. Peter Bond's talk was super interesting to me a few days ago, and it got me really thinking about coarse graining in terms of a way to get to longer time scales. And I know coarse graining isn't your <laughs> expertise, but could you um, talk a bit about you know comparing and contrasting coarse grain versus atomistic, and when you might use one versus the other? Yeah, this is something actually that I was thinking about after reading this this uh, paper on convergence um, is that it mentioned at the end that you may be better off getting better sampling than a better force field. So, you know, a coarse grain is not the greatest force field. It's not, it's, it's an approximation, right? All of this is an approximation, but coarse grain is even a larger approximation, more approximations, but like Michelle said, you can use these coarse grain methods to achieve much greater sampling. And it might be worth it um, just to get, if, you, if you're if you looking at slow time scale movements, um, it might be worth it to run your simulation for, you know, milliseconds, right? Instead of microseconds in order to get the sampling that you need. And, you know, of course, in, in our lab, we use a lot of accelerated MD, and that's, that's another, these other methods are ways to get, get better sampling. But sampling is, I mean, without the right sampling, it depends on what your, your hypothesis is and how you're testing it, but without the, a, a good, good enough sampling, it's, it's hard to tell what's going on. You're not going to be really to, able to tell anything from your simulation. All right, so yeah, I hope we're gonna, you know, of course we're here for another today and tomorrow. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to just come up and talk to me. I'd be happy to help. Thank you.